Well, it is the magic hour. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in for the first uh, lecture of the, of the new year. My name is Scott Newbold. I'm a member of the biology faculty at Sheridan College, and I help coordinate the Sheridan College uh, Science Museum Lecture Series. And we are ever grateful to the support we get for the lecture series from the Sheridan College Foundation and from uh, the Life Science Department and from the volunteers who help run the museum. Um, just a little bit of information about other lectures that are coming up in the spring. We have four other lectures that are scheduled. Tonight's talk, of course, on an important local issue that we'll hear some more about. In February, a talk on bees and their adaptations. And that was a talk that was scheduled for October, but then had to be um, postponed. So that's coming up in February. In March, a talk on the hydrogen economy, fuel cells, and future opportunities in Wyoming. And then in April, a look at CRISPR, um, the gene editing tool. So that one's in April. So shifting our focus back to tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Matt Anger and John Warder, both with the US Forest Service and working on the Bighorn National Forest. Uh, Matt Anger is a hydrologist who has been with the Bighorn National Forest for, since 2016. An Illinois native, Matt attended college at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, where he earned a BS and an MS in forestry, concentrating in forest hydrology and soil science. As a hydrologist with Forest Service, Matt has served on several burned area emergency response teams tasked with assessing the post-fire effects following wildfire. And fire definitely is gonna play a role tonight in the talk, I believe. John has been an employee with the Bighorn National Forest since 2001, living in Sheridan with his family. He's been the forest fire management officer since 2007 and was a wildlife biologist with the Forest Service beginning in 1989. At the end of tonight's lecture, John and Matt would be happy to take questions in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions anytime, um, but they'll do their best to answer those, address those at the end of the talk. So please submit away. With that, um, I'll look at their title. So your local drinking water, Sheridan Municipal Watershed, the source threats and proposed actions on the Bighorn National Forest. Please welcome John and Matt. Good evening, everyone. Matt and I thank you very much in advance for your time. We'd much rather be together to see your faces in an auditorium so we could react better to uh, what you were understanding or not understanding about what we present tonight. But thank you uh, for your attendance. Go ahead, Matt. So this evening, you know, I just was pondering on our water and our watershed. I don't know how many of you have traveled away from Sheridan and you just can't wait to get back to drink our good local water. There's, there's a huge taste difference and we're blessed to have such great water. You know, watersheds and, and the water that comes from them has always been a part of the National Forest Mission. Um, our enabling legislation tying back to the Organic Act um, recognize watersheds as one of the three key values for us as managers over your land. It's the public's land, not the Forest Service's land but that's one of the three key values for us to protect. Then more locally within the state of Wyoming, uh, the Wyoming Water Development Office um, began funding some research projects into watersheds that could be at risk. And those were begun with the Cheyenne and then the Buffalo watershed studies, which took place in 2016. Around the same time, um, Governor Mead at the time um, put forth a task force on forests with insects and disease threats um, tied to wildfires um, as a, a focal effort to uh, emphasize forest management. Uh, the study that Matt and I are gonna cover tonight on the Sheridan Municipal Watershed was completed um, by RESPECT back in 2019. And that was at the request of the Sheridan Area Water Supply Joint Powers Board and again, the Wyoming Water Development Office. Um, if you'd like to see a copy of this report, it is available on our Bighorn National Forest website. Uh, if you look on the left side of the screen, when you get there, look for land and resource management, and then click on projects and look for the Sheridan watershed that lists under analysis. Also, you could just email me and I'd be happy to email it for you. 
Okay, next, um, we just wanted to recognize, and, and this comes straight from, from Dan Coughlin, the administrator for uh, SAWS, that it, it takes all of us to make this work. So it is a collaborative and partner-driven uh, participation that's gonna bring about change in this watershed. Um, I just wanted to recognize some of our uh, more official partners with the state agencies, such as the Wyoming State Forestry, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and of course the Wyoming Water Development Office. Um, more locally, um, Sheridan County Fire Manager and, and Fuels Manager um, have participated with us. And then of course, SAWS Joint Powers Board and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So with that, I'm gonna trade it off over to Matt and he's gonna continue on. All right, so um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about why we're here, um, kind of what brought us here and why we care about the municipal watershed so much. Um, and also a little bit about the work that went into developing a project uh, to get us to where we're at today uh, that John will talk about a little bit here at the end. Um, so, so looking back, you know, we've, we've been seeing an increase in fires, as many people are aware of, you know, not just in the frequency, but the size and the intensity. And these, these fires can be pretty costly, um, not just in terms of putting them out, but also the after effects of them. So looking back, just down in Colorado, we had the Buffalo Creek Fire in 96, and it burned roughly 12,000 acres, um, and it burned over 60% at a, a high intensity, um, which was quite a bit at the time. Um, not too long after that, we had the Hayman fire. Um, and up until just last year, it was the largest fire in Colorado's history. It burned about 137,000 acres. And between the two fires, it cost uh, roughly $27 million um, from the post-fire effects. And that photo that's up there right now is a, a, a photo of a debris flow that happened after. And you can see the amount of sediment that deposited in that channel there. And this was above one of the reservoirs uh, down there in Colorado um, following the Hayman fire. Um, moving a little further south down in New Mexico, um, we had the Sierra Grande fire in 2000. It burned roughly 43,000 acres. Uh, and this fire was, was quite rare because it cost roughly a, a $1 billion or estimated $1 billion in damage there. And the post-fire effects cost the city of Los Alamos $9 million to filter their drinking water following that fire. And you know, seeing this happen, the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico decided to try getting ahead of it. And they came up and they developed a municipal watershed and they did some studies on that uh, watershed plan and they figured it cost roughly $5 million to implement some of the, the projects that they had proposed. And they also estimated that without treatment, or without doing any pre-fire mitigation that if a fire were to burn in their watershed, it was gonna cost them roughly 80 to $240 million for that post-fire mitigation. You know, and this is only becoming kind of more common. You know, it seems like every year we keep hearing about more and more fires and how big they are, um, towns being evacuated and whatnot. Um, and so the risk is there. And so looking, looking at some more recent fires and some closer to home here, uh, this first one I'm going to show you is, is the Mullen Fire. And this one burned mostly in Wyoming, but it did cross over and burn some in Colorado. And this fire burned roughly 176,000 acres, with over 60% of it being burned at a moderate to high intensity. And when you're looking out, you can see that pretty much the entire landscape down there where this fire burned, it, it burned anything that would catch on fire. Uh, just south of there, we also had the East Troublesome Fire. And it burned 170,000 plus acres, and over 50% of that burned at a moderate to high severity fire. Um, and right next to that fire, we also had the Cameron Peak Fire in Colorado, which burned close to 210,000 acres, um, which burned at a pretty moderate to high severity. And all these three fires occurred just this last year, right in our backyard, essentially, um, not too far. So, you know, when the fire is going, you know, we're always worried about, you know, putting it out, putting it out. And, you know, the one thing that we have to think about is that the post fire effects don't, or the, the fire effects don't end when the fire is put out. It's really what comes after the fire. And looking at the photos that I have presented right now, you can see two photos and they're actually taken of the same stream. 
And the photo on the left is, is just upstream of the photo on the right there with the vegetation that you can still see. And it burned completely across the stream channel, leaving little to nothing behind. Um, the ground's pretty much consumed. Um, you can just see some old down uh, timber that's still there. And on the photo on the right, it's actually a series of beaver dams that really is keeping that riparian area intact. I mean, you had the fire burn right up to the edge, um, but mostly that riparian area was kind of still intact. And this was just downstream of the, the photo that's on the left there. And some of these post-fire effects that we're really worried about is due to that loss of vegetation that you can see in these photos. You know, when you're burning the, all the canopy and the ground fuel or the ground vegetation or that organic matter, you're really taking away the protection that's on the, on the landscape to help prevent some of the soil erosion or other debris flows that could come from fire. And, and like I was saying, it's really coming from that loss of vegetation is the first thing. Um, but then there's also the soil erosion that can happen after the fire, um, which also with you know, the nutrients that are coming off the landscape and into the waterways and the soil, you're seeing that decrease in water quality. And at the same time, you could also see a uh, flash flooding event or massive debris, debris flows, like I showed in one of the first photos um, after the Hayman fire of some of that sediment that made its way into the channel. So these are really just some of the issues that we're dealing with um, following a fire. Obviously, there's a lot of other um, uh, issues that come up, but some of the ones that we're really worried about and what we're going to be talking about tonight is those post-fire effects and, and trying to minimize some of these risks that are associated with these large fires. So in order to really talk about this kind of stuff, um, one, you really need to understand what goes into looking at these fires and what comes after them. And in order to do this, we really have to have an understanding of how that area burned. You know, some fire is good. You know, you'll hear that a lot. Some fire is good. Some fires are not so good. And it really depends on that severity. The severity of the fire is what will drive whether or not we can really have um, bad effects or some positive effects. And what I want to talk about here, because this will tie into some of the, the research or some of the studies that were done for this uh, project here. Um, and it really centers around some hydrologic modeling. And John will talk a little bit about the fire modeling as well. Um, but to understand the hydrologic modeling, you also have to understand some of the fire modeling as well. So I'll cover a little bit of that. So with almost every hydrologic model, there's a, a series of things that you need to be able to put in that. And one, you need to know how bad the area burned or what, what happened on the ground. And that's what we call the burn severity. The next thing you really need to know is topography uh, as well as the soil. And then what type of precipitation is normal for that area. Now, like I said, generally following a fire, we would go out there and we would assess how bad the area burned. And this is generally done first through satellite imagery. And generally it's a pre-satellite image and a post-fire satellite image. And then it's a group of scientists that go out on the ground and assess the ground and compare it to what the satellite was seeing to come up with this burn severity. And the map that I'm showing there on the screen is actually from the Mullen fire. And this was a soil burn severity map that was created um, through ground validation to assess how bad that fire burned across um, Southern Wyoming. So what is soil burn severity? You know, there's a lot of times you'll see photos of fires um, or some of those fires that I showed earlier where you're looking out across that landscape and you're seeing just, it looks like everything was completely torched and there's nothing left. Um, well, that's not always the case. And that's why we have to go out there and assess how bad an area did burn or didn't burn. And so soil burn severity is the effect of a fire on a ground surface, or on ground surface characteristics, including char depth, organic matter loss, altered color and structure and reduced infiltration. And then we separate it into three classes of a low, moderate, and high. And so the photo that's up here right now um, is actually a, a photo taken just this past summer. And looking at that soil, uh, that profile there, you can see at the very top, that's a signature of really hot burn. You can see that orange color there. And that is a, um, so it lets us know that that area probably had a lot of heat. But as you move down from that, you can see that there's some charring on the soil 
um, which is another indicator that it did burn pretty hot and it was moving through the soil. But just below that, you can still see that mineral soil. You can still see some fine roots. Um, and that's actually a good sign. So yes, the fire came through there, burned pretty hot, but that soil still has something there that kind of tie it together in the event of a rainstorm um, or an event that would cause erosion or, or another issue to set that up. And so that's really what we're going out there and assessing with burn severity. Um, and burn severity is, is the thing that's probably the most important when we're looking at post-fire impacts. Because um, like I said, not all fire is bad. It's just the really severe fires that cause changes to the soil. Um, those can be problematic and that's what we want to avoid. So one of the hard parts with a study like this, and I, we could have a whole presentation just on these types of models. So I'm going to try being quick. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'd be more than happy to answer them at the end. Um, but we have to model fire um, when there's not a fire. So in order to get the soil burn severity, we're, we're developing that through fire modeling. And for the Sheridan Municipal Watership Project, um, they analyzed fires that could potentially happen. And it runs a whole bunch of different uh, runs of different fires that could happen. And then they kind of compile them together to come up with the worst case scenario. So in order to develop soil burn severity maps based on um, these types of outputs, um, they used fire line intensity and crown fire activity and one other that I'll explain here shortly on the next slide. Um, but something to keep in mind is these outputs do not translate necessarily to soil burn severity. Um, there's the, it's still kind of an emergent science and it's continuously getting better. Um, but what they have to do is they look at past fires to calibrate what these models are showing. And then they're looking at those past fires to try calibrating their models based on that output or what that, what that soil burn severity actually was on the ground. Um, so like I said, it's, it's comparing this against a lot of different fires and pulling together all the best or the most available science at the time when these are run. So for the Sheridan Municipal Watershed, uh, there's three different ways that were estimated or used to estimate soil burn severity. And um, I mentioned the first two already, there were fire line intensity, crown fire activity, and another one that looked at satellite imagery and compared vegetative classes. And these were three different methods that were used uh, to estimate that burn severity based on a moderate to high severity. And this will all get kind of pooled together in these next few slides, but it's kind of important to pick up the difference of each. And you know, you can kind of see some areas that are burning hotter than others, and they're each different, but the, the parts that are the same are the important parts. Now, once, once we kind of had the soil burn severity figured out, to, in order to run a lot of these models or to kind of figure out where, where certain things are happening within the watershed or another way to look at it is where we might see a response. We, we needed to break these watersheds into smaller areas or smaller catchments. And the, the catchments were broke down into 143 different catchments with an average size of around 550 acres. And this is kind of really important, as I mentioned, you know, we need to be able to understand where certain things are happening within the watershed so we can focus in on, on those areas to do potential treatment. And so once, once those were broken down into smaller areas and the hydrologic modeling was done and also looking at that fire modeling, some of the outputs are, are shown here. And the one is the debris flow probability. So that's looking at all of those catchments and taking into effect the burn severity, the topography, precipitation, and the different soils there. And it's kind of estimating or looking at what watersheds or what are the, which, one is, which one of those smaller catchments is going to see the highest response. And that's really important because that helps us narrow or focus in on those important areas that if we were to potentially do something, maybe we could reduce some of those effects. Now, the other photo there is what we were calling a hazard index, um, a hazard index. And that's looking at all the different outputs and then pulling them together and then kind of singling out some of those smaller catchments even more. Um, and this is, this is kind of where that when we look at the hazard catchment, 
this is where we're really starting to see all those watersheds that are continuously standing out amongst all the different outputs that we could potentially have if a fire were to happen and based on all the different models. Now, the, the next part that I kind of want to talk to you, and I, I, like I said, we could have talked a lot longer on those previous parts, but moving along here, um, in order to look at it, at this a little bit closer, we needed to pull out those areas that were starting to pop out from us through the analysis. Those areas that either had a higher response um, or closer to the intakes, things of those matter, uh, nature. Um, but something to take into consideration is that just because we have all that information doesn't mean we can just go out there and do something right away. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff that we have to worry about or take into consideration when we do certain projects like this. And some of those constraints involve land ownership, uh, which thankfully most of the land that the shared and municipal watershed does occur on national forest lands, which is why we're here presenting this. And the other thing to take into consideration is some of the special management areas. The map that's up there right now is showing in the, the green crosshatch there. That's all of our roadless area. And then you can also see in the kind of tannish color or yellowish color is all of our wilderness. So those are other things that we need to factor in when we go to, um, to do potential work on the ground. And then also the habitat, um, whether it's some elk security zones or other wildlife concerns. And most important, or one of the more important ones as well, is just the operability. That photo that is on the slide there is taken near the forest boundary, near the confluence of West Fork and East Fork of Goose Creek. And you can really see the ruggedness of that area and how steep it is. You're not really going to be able to get in there and be able to do a whole lot of work. And also it's roadless. So that's kind of some of the stuff that we're up against and just wanted to take a moment to, to show that. I think it really shows some of the constraints that we're up against. So taking all that kind of stuff in, and like I said, I threw a whole lot at you and a lot of, a lot of science and a lot of data goes into generating these maps. Um, but taking all that information and all of our con management constraints, uh, we put together what we consider a prioritization matrix. And this is taking those models that were ran for the fire modeling and the modeling that was done for the hydrologic side of things. It's also looking at the operability and the permitting uh, slash administrative considerations, that habitat and also the forest access. And so we're really trying to look at as much as we possibly can uh, and you know pull out all the key areas, but at the same time, we need to understand that we can't treat the entire place um, and we're really trying to identify those areas that are going to have the most risk or the areas that we might be able to do something in. And so that really helps us move forward as we, we do some of the planning, which John will talk to you about here next. Thanks, Matt. We're about halfway through, folks, of our presentation time with you. So again, thanks for hanging with us. Um, so transitioning from those modeled areas that, that Matt was depicting for you comes now to the planning and implementation phase. So for us as managers, we need to delineate a project area within which we would like to do some proposed actions to try and change the conditions, okay? Um, so what you're seeing on the orange there, which should be orange on, on your map, um, is the project, sorry, is the municipal watershed. And then we delineated in brown the project area. And like Matt mentioned, um, with the wilderness area, that is a, a large management constraint. The, the emphasis for that land is for uh, pristine conditions and wilderness experience. We are not gonna propose to go up there and, and manipulate timber. That is not consistent with the Wilderness Act. So we did include some areas outside of the municipal watershed, and I'll show you a fire modeling slide as to why that is, because fire doesn't just start within one of these watersheds, it can carry into it from outside the watershed. Go ahead, Matt. Great, so I wanna take us back to a little bit of fire ecology. Probably most of you have been around fire enough to, to see it. It's a, it's a great wonderment to the human 
uh, experience for sure. But as Matt mentioned, you know, he talked about some good or some not so good fires. We have to remember that fire is a natural process for landscape diversity. It was uh, designed with fire and fire is often part of its adaptation. Um, fire accomplishes um, some of that resilience on the landscape when it comes to any harsh effects. Um, just like a human population, we need a broad diversity in age classes in order to survive such things as COVID. Well, national forest landscapes are the exact same thing, whether it's a disease ep epidemic or a fire, which are probably two largest disturbance processes in, in this type of uh, montane boreal forest. Um, we need resilience out there on the landscape. So the second point on the slide there is that, you know, for at least since the 1950s, um, the Forest Service and, and lots of other land managers and, and firefighters have really ramped up their ability to be able to suppress fires. Um, but we're now starting to see some of the dangers of suppressing fires for too long. And that danger is, is that you end up with a monoculture or a lack of diversity on the landscape, particularly in, in forest vegetative types. And that sets the stage for a large insect epidemic and or a fire. So uh, fire managers, scientists have developed a way to be able to describe that. And we lump them into fire regimes. All that basically means is the number of years between a quote unquote natural fire cycle. Okay, in other words, what happened pre-European settlement. Um, the second part of that would be a condition class. And that is, the number of cycles missed, okay? So most of the national forest on the municipal watershed here in Big Goose Creek is comprised of lodgepole. So its natural fire regime is greater than 100 years. In other words, it's gonna be a stand replacing fire for the most part, and it's gonna take about 100 years to build up enough of that fuel on the ground and get the age of the trees that are more susceptible to drought and other conditions to provide larger fires. Now, that being said, um, a fire's extent or how far it travels on the landscape is also a big determinant of the effects of which Matt was talking about. So we need to remember that even though it's lodgepole and it has the serotonous cones that need a great amount of heat to open the cones to, to begin that new forest, um, we get fires every year that are just a single tree hit by lightning or caused by a human, that just the tree burns. Or you get some of the examples that Matt shared with you of 180,000 acres. All of that is possible on this landscape that's your Bighorn National Forest. Um, the kind of second uh, main type of forest up in this watershed would be your Engelmann spruce, subalpine fir, and then we've got little pockets of aspen up there. The fire regime for those species is greater than 200 years. So it takes 200 years from the last disturbance to build up enough fuels and get those stand conditions where the whole stand could end up burning. Um, those species, by the way, have to draw their seed from what's in the seed bed or from neighboring stands with wind dispersion blowing in seed, okay? Uh, the case of the Little Goose Fire back in 2007, likely many of you were around for that, uh, if not, when you wake up in the morning, take a look southwest of town and you'll see the quote unquote scar on the landscape up there that leads right up to Little Goose Peak. Okay, it has not revegetated, reforested yet, I should say. Um, that's primarily a ponderosa pine area that burned. And we have a little bit of that um, down low in the Big Goose watershed. But what happened with that is it was so old and mature that the neighboring seed source is gonna take a long time for the seed to disperse back in there, okay? Fire history in the Big Goose watershed. Um, we had a researcher come out from the USGS in 1897 and 1898 who recorded and took some pictures of what he saw then. Um, and he reported widespread fires during the late 1800s, okay, when he was here. When you look at the, the watershed up there, you'll see a lot of monoculture um, resulting from that. It's not saying the entire landscape burned at all, um, even as Matt's picture showed you from the big fires. That's not necessarily the case. Okay, go ahead, Matt. This next slide I want to show you is just depicting that. Um, if you are looking out across the landscape, and I, the next time you're all out for a hike up on the forest, 
check it out. Get to a high point, look across. You can see the bright green areas kind of in the uh, middle ground of this picture. That's a young stand. And then you'll see the older stand sticking up above it that is indicative of where fire didn't get to or that disturbance did not get to um, when that happened. So hopefully that makes sense. Go ahead, Matt. All right, so here is a map of the fire regimes within the lower 48. I'm not gonna show you uh, Hawaii or Alaska. Um, so here's the lower 48 and it's meant to make us think about some national concerns that go along with this. Um, if you can't spot the big horns, look in north central Wyoming, there's a little red sliver there. And if you look down on the legend on your lower left, that's showing that spruce and fir and some of the lodgepole on the forest. And then of course, uh, a class or a regime four kind of surrounding that, which is more of that lodgepole. Obviously the big green swath in the middle of the US is the plains, okay? So that's meant to have a regime of zero to 35 years naturally, okay? And a lot of that had to do with uh, rotational buffalo grazing that was going on. And of course, um, just lightning starts by wildfire every year burned a lot of the grasslands. So Matt touched on it a little bit, and that is what about the current climate's effect on fires? Um, we in, in the fire world now describe it as the fire year. We used to say, oh yeah, I remember that season, but now it's the year. Um, places from California primarily, um, less so here in Wyoming, but folks are active fighting fire all year long. And that's a big change. So climate does have an effect on the fire season. Generally, um, it's just much longer and the fires are, are larger and more severe is what we're seeing under the current climate. Costs, um, we all have to think about costs as taxpayers. It's billions a year that the federal government spends fighting wildfires. Now, maybe that doesn't stack up next to an aircraft carrier, but it does drive you to make some decisions and to local communities in particular that are dependent on these landscapes, okay? Um, a big national effort that's going on is what's called the cohesive strategy. And that looks at um, how to prepare communities for the inevitable wildfire. So what fuel treatments can be done in that area? What kind of prevention measures are being done? And largely that is driven at what we call the wildland urban interface or WUI for short. Um, since oh, about the 1970s, we've seen a large development pattern where folks want to build their houses out in to the forested areas, not on the national forest, kind of difficult to get to build there, wish that might've been different, but. <laughs> so folks are putting their houses out in these wildland areas where they interface. And that is where fire managers are spending all their time and money and resources focusing on that. Um, so that is a, a big change that's happened in the recent decades. So that cohesive strategy is across all agencies from local fire up through national federal resources to try and make landscapes more resilient. So in the national forest, what that means for us is we're doing some thinning around some of those summer, summer home cabin groups, um, as well as the resorts, just knowing that there is going to be fire hitting those and we'll be more successful as firefighters to protect those values if we can do some of those treatments in advance. Same thing that hopefully folks that live in fire prone areas are doing on their own backyard and front yard and around the sides of the house because sooner or later, fire's coming at you. Okay, fire prevention, I wanna to touch on that really quick. Maybe that would just solve everything if we were better at fire prevention. Not the case, um, even most of the largest fires that we had this year, there was a human component to them, okay? Um, you just, you, you can't just, you buy your way out of fire with prevention or even fuels treatments. They're coming, the fires are coming. Um, I wanted to touch really quickly on the risk of wildfires. That's near and dear to my heart. Um, when we hire your all's children to come work as firefighters, I never wanna have to make that phone call home that something happened to that firefighter out there on the ground. So we've changed our tactics in a lot of cases to recognize where there are dense fuels and we're not gonna be successful with firefighters on the ground, um, it's not worth the risk to put people in there. That being said, our success rate on initial attack and at um, positively conducting prescribed burns and not losing them is right around 97%.
So that's still under an aggressive fire management scenario. Go ahead, Matt. All right, I wanna talk about a couple factors underneath those pictures. So I'm gonna start on the left in terms of what carries fire on the Bighorn landscape. Um, it is not so much the grass component, it is an, almost entirely the forest understory, the, the litter that's there, particularly the larger um, logs that may be dead and down. The way fire spreads oftentimes is from spotting. So an ember can carry oftentimes greater than a half a mile away. So you just can't simply go in on a, a fire that's got a, a good head of steam to it and dig a fire line when you're taking embers spotting across up to half a mile. You'll never catch it, okay? The other thing that's interesting is almost all of our larger fires are driven by cold fronts, oftentimes dry ones, that will come through an upper level air mass disturbance. And it almost always starts with a southwest wind flow. Almost all of our fires, you can see that or look back in history to see that that's how they're spreading. And then as that cold front passes, uh, the predominant wind shifts around to the northwest, okay? Um, basically, the only thing that stops our large fires is either rain coming or the wind stopping. So that's what happens. Um, Crown fire in particular, that's what always makes the beautiful fix, uh, pictures and uh, inspires the fear of God in all of us. Um, those are almost always due to an alignment of several factors. Um, topography being one, how steep the slope is, okay? The weather, obviously hot, dry, windy, okay? And then finally, what is the fuel conditions? Have they been drying out throughout the whole summer or is it spring and so they're moist and they're not able to carry? We kind of call that the wildland fire tri triangle of fuels, weather, and topography. Next, looking under the picture of the Gilead fire over on the right. And by the way, I just showed these fire pictures to show you that yes, the Bighorn does have large fires, even though we weren't in the spotlight this last summer, we basically dodged a bullet this last summer. Um, and that is, what factors do we consider in responding to fires? Um, managers and, and our administrative officers have to determine, okay, what are the values at risk up there? What are we willing to commit to, both in risk to firefighters and the cost to the public to fight this fire, okay? It also determines on the time of the year what resources are available and the effectiveness of those resources. You know, we often see pictures of retardant aircraft coming in on a, on a great drop. Those are not effective under a crown fire scenario or extremely dry and particularly forested fuels. Um, retardant is very effective in shrub and grass fuel types, not so much so in forests. So, and by the way, they're incredibly expensive. Um, a large air tanker can cost $50,000 for one drop. Okay, I already talked about fuels, weather, topography. Um, next, when it comes to a national forest, we also have to consider the forest plan management areas. In other words, um, it is not conducive for us to take a bulldozer into wilderness areas to try and suppress a fire. That's not going to happen. Um, so we take a look at the management emphasis that's described in the forest plan when it comes time to evaluate whether how we're going to suppress a fire and where and when. And you can well guess my last statement on the bottom of the screen there, what's likely in a steep and heavily forested watershed when drought lines up and the weather lines up. Go ahead, Matt. All right, so back to kind of the modeling in our big goose watershed that we drink from. Um, modeling is going to use a, a certain number of fuel models that are developed. Those are developed from satellite imagery with ground truthing, kind of the way Matt mentioned in terms of uh, the burn area severity mapping. Um, so these are satellite based. Um, I'm gonna jump to the bottom there bullet. And as you look at this picture, which I took from uh, close to the forest boundary, looking down towards the water treatment plant, you can see, these are actually Douglas fir trees in the picture. You can see the tightness of the canopy as you look down the slope. You can also see that branches are continuing down towards the lower end of the slope. Those two conditions are what support crown fire, okay? So when the fire modeling is done, the, the modeling specialist picks the fuel model, okay? And then combines with the known weather patterns. Those for this watershed 
were taken almost entirely from our remote automated weather station that's up at Burgess Junction. That's the closest one we have, um, the best longest history weather to draw from. So they will determine how likely a high wind event is going to occur, how long that dry period is, and generally when moisture falls. And then they'll apply that to the fire model. I gotta make a comment. We uh, had a great forester that worked for us a long time here on the forest. One of his favorite comments was, all models are wrong, some are more useful than others. So um, the fire modeling approach for this watershed started with a model called BEHAVE. We use that as fire managers um, when we're predicting what's gonna happen with a prescribed burn. We will model a fire ignition point and see how that's likely to spread. Okay, but that's only one point. So the flam map model that Matt was uh, showing you some pictures of the results, it takes those single point ignitions and then spreads them across the landscape. And then it gives you the ability to do that hundreds of times so you can get an average, okay? And of course, when they modeled it, they tried to pick the more worst case scenario uh, weather settings that would drive those fires. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna focus in on uh, two of those results. Matt showed you the Crown Fire Activity slide. Um, I wanna draw your attention, if you can see it on your screen, the municipal watershed is that smaller black watershed within that larger uh, polygon that's shown there. So again, um, the modelers looked at, okay, what are the adjoining landscapes to this municipal watershed? And what is that likely to show in terms of fire spread into it, okay? Um, what's interesting to note about crown fires, we describe them as being dependent or independent. Dependent referring to the fire is going to spread with or in conjunction with the ground fuels underneath it versus an independent crown fire means it can just run through the tops of the trees. That's what you'll get when drought stricken, uh, a lot of uh, low fuel moisture in your canopy of the trees. Now, it'll also show for the bulk of the area torching. Okay, torching is when you get a single tree that torches or groups of trees. It is not transitioned to a crown fire that's moving through stands, okay? Um, like I mentioned, um, great modeling effort, but when you think about some of the steeper landscapes or topography that's in the watershed, I would be surprised on the right day if it were limited to only torching, okay? Next, let's shift over to the right-hand side of your screen, which shows the model results for flame length. Um, we as firefighters uh, will take note to this, um, we'll model that out. We have fire behavior analysts on large incidents that model this to determine firefighter safety. So what it means for us is that anything that's above a four foot flame length is not gonna be effectively fought by Matt or John with their Pulaski trying to dig fire line along it. We're just not gonna keep up with it. The heat is too much. Similarly, an eight foot flame length is generally considered um, the limit for when mechanized equipment, bulldozers, are not gonna be effective, okay? And then that 11 foot length um, is gonna be the limit when it's considered effective with uh, any kind of uh, aerial firefighting. So when you look at this map, it's a little more valuable to see that almost everything in the watershed is greater than 11 foot flame lengths, okay? So on the right day, we are not gonna be successful with any number of ground firefighters and or equipment being deployed in there. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, so maybe the next question is, is okay, if you're spotting a half mile fires, what are some effective barriers to that? Um, we have found that one of the best barriers is previous fires. The photo on your upper left depicts a young lodgepole stand. Um, they regenerate prolifically after wildfire. Um, so if that's a large enough stand, that's a great fire barrier. Uh, the picture on the right is also looking um, up towards, that's black tooth in the very background there, from within the watershed. Sure, a rock pile is a great little barrier for a tiny fire. Um, kind of in the middle ground of the photo, you'll see some more thinned out forests up in there. That can aid in dropping the fire back down to the ground where we might have a chance to catch that fire if that was a desired outcome in that area. So it's, it's reducing the canopy closure of trees and also lifting up the forest vegetation clearing it off the lower branches so that it's not transitioning into a crown fire. 
Um, the third photo, kind of lower left there, obviously some of the best fuel barriers are a, a change in the fuel model or a change in the fuel type. So looking up at She Bear Mountain there, um, those grassy slopes, um, that's oftentimes where we can be effective, either with aircraft or people. And, and that's what we rely on most besides the uh, rock and ice of the wilderness to stop fires. You know, Matt mentioned the East Troublesome Fire down in Colorado. Very interesting that that spread with enough spotting clear up and over similar terrain, which is rock and ice for them down there. Okay, so next, when it comes to barriers, not only how big are they and where we put them, that's what I mean by juxt juxtaposition, but how much time do you wanna spend or do you have before the fire arrives and how much money do you wanna spend, okay? And then of course, anything you're doing in a forested environment, also is only going to be good for a certain number of years or is going to require maintenance. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, next, Matt and I want to kind of transition to talking about, well, what are some of the things that our collaborators and, and we as the Forest Service are thinking about for proposed actions to help change this condition? Um, the first one I want to address with you is, is what's proposed for timber harvest and fuels reduction. Remember I talked about getting some diversity back on the landscape. That's the goal with these treatments. So you will see some black polygons on your map there. Um, that is where mechanical harvest we are proposing would occur. Um, again, that's basically a timber sale. We'll go in with mechanized equipment to make those changes on the landscape. They could be clear cuts that are greater than 40 acres. They might just be thinning, okay? Next is kind of some brown polygons that are in those roadless areas that Matt showed as a management constraint. Those are proposed about 9,000 acres worth for hand thinning, okay? So we'll contract largely crews that go in, we'll thin that and pile it um, so that we can come back later and burn those piles. And that will again, break up that canopy and help keep fire on the ground. Lastly, um, the red hatch polygons on the north end of that map um, describe where we think prescribed fire could be used as a tool. You say, why there? Well, basically we can't get there with hand crews, can't get there because of the steepness, remoteness with any other type of tool. So prescribed fire might be appropriate there. Um, you may ask, well, how are you gonna stop that fire on the forest boundary? The only way that prescribed burning would work is in conjunction with adjacent landowner cooperation. We've done that in other areas in the forest, uh, mostly different fuel types in this, but have been successful. Um, also, the timing of that would have to be late fall. If you can remember back to this fall when there was snow up high on the mountain um, and then another weather system coming in, those are the kind of windows we look for where you could back a fire down that hillside and then rely on, hopefully, um, moisture coming in that next system. Go ahead, Matt. Next. Um, we wanted to venture into some aspen and riparian areas. And you may think, wow, those are really wa valuable wildlife habitat or other um, purposes. Why would you wanna do treatments in there? That's because those are natural fuel breaks. Obviously the extent of the aspen isn't as large. The riparian areas are small, but just like the burn severity map, um, sorry, the pictures of the Mullen fire that Matt showed you, um, that's the impetus behind those, is to restore a natural fuel break component to those areas. Um, so what Matt was suggesting is to get into some of those riparian areas, those are the green polygons on your map, and be able to thin the trees out of there. All that would have to be done by hand. You don't want to drag a dozer through a meadow that's in a creek, obviously. So hand thinning to let those meadows retain more of that moisture and perform more as a fuel break. Similarly, the orange polygons for aspen, um, we propose to go in there and remove the conifer trees. That could be done commercially where there's road accessible and not other management constraints or done by hand. Um, really quickly, as you're looking at these maps, I realize how tiny they are. If you go to our website, you can download the map and be able to zoom in it with the Adobe Pro um, functions. Actually, regular Adobe does it just fine. So go to our website, check it out or email me, I can email you the maps. Okay, lastly, um, third bullet there would be um, Matt um, brought forward a similar technique that he used from down in the Buffalo Municipal Watershed. Um, and that is trying to restore um, beaver's presence on the landscape. Um, lots of history into, into that particular species, but 
we're shy of them compared to what we used to have. And they are key, as Matt showed you in that photo, for maintaining riparian functioning. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, next. Um, anything on the forest always comes down to recreation and roads, right? That's where we as people focus our time up there in, in enjoying the forest. Um, so one of the key things we have to look at is road maintenance. Wherever a road crosses a stream, that is a high sediment load area. So we want to make sure and address the maintenance of those crossings out there. Next, the national forests were directed to do a travel analysis. Um, so every time that we look at a new project area in compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, we need to look at these travel analysis reports and take a look at what the recommendations, those were all developed in-house. That's why we bring this out during the NEPA project so that the public can comment on these proposed actions. Okay, so one of those would be decommissioning. Um, if you look on the left-hand side of the map, there are three roads up towards Sawmill Divide there. Um, that are already closed to motorized access to the public. We still have a management responsibility on those to keep the drainage and the prism. Um, we are proposing it's not worth our money to keep that up. Those roads are not slated for use for any other thing. They're historic um, timber harvest roads, basically. Um, so we would be decommissioning those. It doesn't mean that we can't go back in there and build a road in 30 years if there's a need for it. But for now, we're not going to want to spend further money maintaining those. Next. I wanna draw your attention to the right-hand side of the map, lower right-hand side. You can see a little orange line with text that says user-created route. So what that is, is us as the public, you and I meaning, when we're out and about, sometimes folks will take their vehicle across the landscape and pretty soon you've got a road established. Um, that's not something the forest ever designed and implemented. So we'd have to decide through this project, do we wanna keep that trail on the landscape or should we remove it? So that's why we highlight that for public's ability to be able to weigh in on that. Okay, next in terms of roads, I wanna highlight your attention to kind of the left center portion of the map, just north of the Dome Lake private land area to a text label that says 284. That is actually an, an open motorized route, but it is horrible. Most folks only use it with UTVs, ATVs. So we're proposing um, through this project to make about a half mile of that only into um, uh, motorized trail, which means UTVs, ATVs. Um, to, to keep it up to a uh, truck type standard would cost us a lot of money over time. So we'd like to make that switch. Okay, let's go to the recreation side of the house more. Um, so if you look at the big goose area, the dead center middle of your map, um, little private land cross hatch in there, just north of that is a, a pretty good collection of summer homes. Um, those folks are recognizing some increased use of the trail that goes down Big Goose Creek from there, and they don't particularly appreciate people parking right in the front yard area of their cabins. So we'd like to um, clear off an area, develop a little bit of a trailhead there. Next, uh, recreation always comes down to waste management. Um, so you're going to see two yellow circles um, down in the park, reser area, park reservoir area on your map. So that's kind of the lower central part of your map, two yellow polygons. Um, we need to develop some toilet facilities in those areas. Go ahead, Matt. All right, getting closer to the end here. I know I've been rambling. So our, our goal with those proposed actions is to actually achieve a balance of treatments out there. Um, Matt very uh, gracefully guide us, guided us through the Buffalo Municipal Watershed Project, same type of land, same issues. Um, and we found, he found that if we strive to be able to treat somewhere around 15% of that landscape, we won't be damaging or increasing the sediment through our treatments, but we'll also be providing some meaningful treatments to reduce the more extreme wildfire spread capability. Okay, so that's what we're after there. I think the third bullet is important to note, both us and, and the city and SAWS water managers recognize that there's gonna be significant risk remaining. If you'll remember that project area, the far north end of it is just steep vertical country in no man's land. Um, very high potential for a, a severe fire in that area, which could still impact the water treatment facility. Okay, um, similar along those lines, our water managers are looking at other backup sources and or treatment ideas in the event of wildfires. Now, project funding, you say, how in the world are you gonna get the, all those treatments done that are out there on the landscape? Similar to the Buffalo project, 
Um, there are some additional grants and funding available out there. That is a collaborative process that we need to go through. And yes, could easily take 10 years or more to make those uh, come about on the landscape. Hey, a little fun fact that goes with the picture there, and that is less than 50% of our fires are lightning caused. That means you and I leaving our campfires out there. I know, sounds like Smokey, I gotta make the plug. It is we're still a large component to wildfires out there. Um, it's also interesting to note that many fires go undetected or will last a long time and then come to life when uh, you have a more uh, severe weather event. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, to wrap up kind of this project in, in interacting with us as the Forest Service, it is a collaborative process. We listen to the public, we get valuable ideas. That's why we have partners um, sitting in on our interdisciplinary team meetings. Um, so this timeline is coming up quickly. We need written comments from anybody that's interested um, by February 9th. What that does is, is guarantee you a slot for um, your comments um, being taken again later when we come out with a draft environmental assessment. Uh, that'll be coming out hopefully in about June and we'll re-release that to the public, but you need to make comments now um, if you care to be involved and or later object if you think our actions are wrong and you want to try and stop us. You've got to submit those comments now, okay? Um, like I mentioned, the maps, um, the project descriptions, all of that's located on our website. It might be easier for you just to email me. My email is listed there. Please feel free to do so or give me a call. Um, you know, Matt talked about good fires. I'd like to propose that this one pictured there, the reservoir fire back in 2011, um, we took a look at that fire start. It was natural lightning and it was in the wilderness. Um, we got together a incident management team and found that we had a, a fairly highly reliable area to be able to pinch that fire off from coming down Shell Canyon. And so therefore we decided to manage that for resource objectives, meaning what? Let's get some diversity back out on the landscape. So about 2,000 acres burned under a mixed severity. So some areas severe, some low, most of it moderate. Um, so that was a very successful implementation of that fire management strategy. Go ahead, Matt. All right, so we'd like to quit talking at you and hopefully not putting you to sleep for the night and open it up to some questions and answers, which Matt and I are gonna ask for uh, Scott Newbold's help in managing that. So Scott, maybe you could tell folks how to implement that question and answer function and, and we'll do our best for you. You bet. First, thanks very much, you two. Great story. Um, and let's see if there are some questions from Matt and John. So at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom window, you should see the Q&A box if you submit questions there. And we can see them on this side. And it looks like there may be two questions there now. Let's see, are you able to see those, John and Matt? I can. I'll take the first one, Matt, while you take a look at the second one from Dan. So Adia, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, are forest service agencies usually lenient or cooperative when there is a fire in their forest? I'm gonna assume that to mean, is it a collaborative process to manage a fire? Um, my response to that is, is if it's a large enough fire, we engage um, the, the partners that it may affect or that have some jurisdiction in that area. And we agree on the objectives and strategies that we're gonna use to, in, to manage that fire that's on the landscape, okay? Um, second part of that question is, is will they let you bring in a lot of your own equipment and uh, supplies that you need to use to put the fire out? Um, yes. So again, depending upon the land management restrictions, like wilderness areas, we're not going to go in there with a bunch of bulldozers and try and make a fire line that's six dozers wide. That is not appropriate with wilderness management. So it depends on the landscape and the resources available and the time you have um, before the fire is gonna make a run to try and implement some of those. Matt, you wanna take Dan's? Yeah, and um, Dan's exactly right. You know, some of the modeling that's done does get it right. <clears throat> and uh, while I was down on the Mullen fire this past year, um, I had an opportunity to kind of see some of the Cheyenne uh, Municipal Watershed um, resources or structures that were in place there. And um, there was a lot of work that was done around their reservoirs. And the fire burned pretty much right up to it um, and didn't burn it completely into their watershed. And a lot of that came, um, well, some of it came from past fires that burned in that area. Um, but also, um, it did come from some of that modeling to help target some of their uh, work that they needed to do on the ground. Um, 
one. So, so yeah, some models do get it right. Dan, I in no way meant, meant to uh, discredit the modeling done there. We definitely use it in Buffalo Municipal Watershed and we're using it now. That just was uh, the fire manager side saying, you can't tell how high that fire is gonna grow always. Thank you for the comment. I've got one for the two of you while we're waiting for the next one. I see a couple here. Um, just in terms of your own professional experience with the Forest Service and different projects you've worked on, how's this rank in terms of uh, uh, things that you've, that, you, that you've sunk time into? Interesting projects, uh, lots of challenges. How did it sort of pan out? I'll go first and then Matt can tag on to that. Um, for us, we've been trying to tra transition to these type of projects, looking at a larger project area and definitely municipal watersheds are a key focus nationally. We, we all recognize where we get our water. Um, so it's, it's also very challenging, but also very interesting for us as managers. And as, as Dan Coughlin is great at pointing out, it, it has to be collaborative to try and get it right on the landscape because it's the mix of you know, the reservoirs that supply it to the landscapes that drive it to the treatment facility that sends it. Okay, I'm gonna read off Jeff's comment. Sorry, Matt, did you have anything else to add to that to Scott's question? Nope, I think you had it there. Okay, uh, Jeff, thanks for your comment. Glad to hear that you guys are taking the time to talk to us tonight. I do have a question on how much consideration you give on beetle kill areas. Having worked for the Buffalo BLM many years, I know that there is a lot in our area. So Matt, great question. Um, a lot is what I'll call a relative term. Um, compared to our neighbors in Southern Wyoming, they see a lot and that's epidemic. Um, we don't really have any epidemics going. Um, you'll just see little endemic outbreaks. Um, certainly the, the Douglas fir that has died along both the faces um, of the bighorns um, could be a little closer to an epidemic. Um, but yes, we definitely consider beetle kill in this particular watershed, again, with the remote areas that's there, um, it would be difficult to do anything meaningful to help slow that down. Again, a natural process, um, thinning does, has been shown to help, um, but if the weather's right, it's all those factors play together to drive um, epidemics. Um, also to note, I mentioned the, the watershed, a lot of the forest stands are at about that 100 year peak um, we might see insect activity kick up in the next several decades as those stands continue to mature and the trees do not have the resolve to push out the outbreaks. Thanks for your question. Matt, you get Dan. Oh, that's the same one. Yeah, that's the same one there. <clears throat> yeah, there's one at the top from an anonymous attendee. I can read it out. Uh, is there, are there areas of the Bighorn National Forest where managed fires may be the best option rather than suppression? other than wilderness? Great question. What the, what the individual, I think, is trying to describe of a managed fire, um, to me, every fire gets a management response. We're either gonna try and suppress it with everything, depending upon those values at risk, or we may let some resource objectives come into play. Um, so basically what we have in our forest plan is a map that shows um, high suppression focus areas. And of course, they're where um, developments occur on the forest, and then areas where we can consider um, more resource objectives, and then areas like the wilderness where we must consider resource objectives first. Um, so yes, there is some flexibility on the landscape. Oftentimes for us, it is the risk to the firefighters that is now driving us, where we cannot make a, a good um, decision for their safety and the finances involved. We're probably not going to engage in those areas, and the fire is going to move. I hope that addressed your question better. Please type another if I missed it. And thank you for your comment. One other question I've got that comes to mind, Matt, it sounds like you helped lead up the Buffalo project. Were there substantive differences between those two sets of analyses on the different watersheds or things that you learned in Sheridan that shed light on Buffalo or can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And, <clears throat> you know, I'd say the, the Buffalo Municipal Watershed was a really good um, first step for us because it was kind of new. Um, so in, in taking this type of data or this type of information and actually using it um, in a beneficial way or a proactive way, um, I think was new to us and new to me especially. Um, and it, it does kind of help pick out areas that you necessarily you wouldn't necessarily look at. 
Um, and also, you know, putting that up to other fires, um, like the, some of those pictures that I showed earlier uh, in the presentation, with areas of the riparian where, you know, you'd have riparian areas completely burned over, um, but you had an area, say, that might have had less trees in that riparian area, more willow or beaver activity, um, you could really see how the landscape responded when fire did come through there. Um, and so when you kind of start picking up those spots or some of those analysis are showing that, you know, you can really see, you know, okay, oh, well, if we did some treatment here, you know, we might not stop the fire altogether, but we might create a little bit of a buffer or something to leave on the landscape that, that kind of leave it more intact. So I think it's a continuous learning process and you know, this is kind of still new and emerging science with doing predictive fire, predictive hydrologic modeling, and trying to treat the landscape ahead of time so these fires aren't as costly in their aftermath. So yeah, I, I think the Buffalo Municipal Watershed really helped us get to where we need to be for the Sheridan Municipal Watershed, and we're constantly learning and trying to improve upon it. Thanks for your question. Yeah, neat, thanks. Other questions from those of you out there? If not, I think John has shared his contact info and I think you can probably find both John and Matt. If there are follow-up questions, you can also submit them uh, here. And um, one more question just popped up from Dan. Dan, that's a great one in terms of uh, folks that wanna help out in different aspects of the project. Um, again, I think submitting comments to us, engaging with us would be wonderful. Um, a component to this project for some successful funding opportunities does need to take place on adjacent lands to the forest in order to be able to tap into some special funds that way. Um, so maybe some of those private landowners would have projects um, that, that would be suitable to them to do that as well. All right, well, let us uh, thank John and Matt, sorry, silently from the crowd that's out there, but maybe a, a virtual clapping is going on. Uh, really appreciate the two of you taking time tonight and for putting together um, this, this analysis of what you were able to look at in the water, both watersheds. Um, really cool story and uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in and uh, look forward to touching base with everybody soon. So have a good evening. Thanks very much, Matt and John. We'll see you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thanks, Scott, for hosting it. Thank you.